morning, friends. Welcome to Worship with First United Methodist Church. Church is on the move for Christ here in Winchester, Frederick County, Virginia. My name is Sean Devilites. I'm the pastor here at First UMC, and I'm so glad that you are here to be part of our online worship today. A couple of things you should know. First, we're pre-recorded, so you're going to see us in different places at different times, uh, sometimes even different outfits throughout the service. But I think it's a great way for as many people as possible to be part of our online worship and that you get a chance to see them. Uh, we're going to continue our series on superpowers today. So you're going to hear something about this guy named Paul and how he's able to hear people and recognize and respect where they are coming from as he continues to share the good news. So that's really cool. Uh, throughout the service, now you can like, comment, or share, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. Let us know where you're worshiping from, any uh, prayer concerns you might have, anything else you want to comment. Uh, we'd love to just see the way the Spirit brings us together with that. But again, we are so glad that you're here. Let's worship together. Stacy Stickley, and I'm going to be reading scripture for you today from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 28. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Morning again, friends. If you missed it at the beginning, my name is Sean Bevelice. I'm the pastor here at First UMC. And today we're continuing our series entitled Superpowers. Uh, we've been hearing of some familiar super pow- superheroes from scripture, as well as some familiar superheroes from culture. And we're asking ourselves what types of powers that we ordinary citizens can tap into, whether we find our superheroes in those places or somewhere else in the world. Over the last two weeks, we've been reminded of how the plot of Queen Esther's story, helps us understand why a hero is called to care for such a time as this. We've also heard of how the action that takes place in the Exodus story with Moses helps us understand that God has an unbelievable power that is worth believing in. This week, we hear a story about the Apostle Paul and how he shares the good news of Christ with the community while still respecting and honoring their stories and their perspectives. We're going to reflect on how God is inviting us to think through the places in our lives where we can create that kind of space for others to know Christ too. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. You know, it's kind of crazy to think about it, but uh, this time this this late June means I've been with you all at first UMC for just about a year Um, it's kind of it's crazy right how quickly that year has gone by and as I think about it that means I've been a full-time pastor for about six years and as I reflect on all that I remember all the different things I've gotten to do all the different opportunities I've had and the different places where I've been able to be in conversation with people and one of those conversations I had actually took place a, a couple years ago and it was in a class that I was teaching. And what I was trying to do at the time, I was trying to teach about Noah and the ark. And I mentioned to the folks in the class how Noah was listening to God and and built the ark so that he and the animals would live through this flood. And suddenly some of the folks in class started to ask questions of me. And the dialogue went something like this. Uh, Someone raised their hands and called on them and they were like, well, did Noah die? I was like, well, no, Noah survived because he, another question came in, cutting me off. Well, did Jesus die? I was like, no, Jesus didn't die on the, someone else rose a hand. "Ah, Yes, Jesus did die. He died on the cross. I was like, well, all right, well, technically, and then someone else jumped in. Did God die on the cross? Let's pray, is what I said at that point in time. And you might wonder what kind of class left me tripping over my words like that. And it was actually a preschool chapel class. Because you see, for all of my degrees, all of my experience at the time, I was in a context where none of that really mattered much. It was a context where questions required attention sometimes more than some kind of answer, where a dialogue was needed and not a monologue. Maybe you can relate to that story. I I hope you can relate to that story because it also gives us some insight and understanding about our scripture passage this morning that we find in Acts and the story of Paul's preaching in a city that you've probably heard of called Athens. And for those that don't know, the book of Acts is this book that describes the early church movement after Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, We hear about the Holy Spirit a lot, and we should also know that it's a book that's written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke. It's really a sequel to Luke. And so for as much of the New Testament is written by Paul, like Paul's letters, this is one of those instances where we hear a story about Paul. And if you've you know, familiar with the Apostle Paul, you know he used to be called Saul. He was the artist formerly known as Saul, if you will. He's a guy who came of age in the Roman Empire and was really well trained and had a formal education and knew multiple languages, had all these gifts of speaking and energy and just being really smart. And for part of his life, his thought process, his job was to somehow defend the Jewish tradition from these upstart Christian believers. He persecuted a lot of Christian believers. And somewhere along the way, that changed for him. Actually, if you read Acts 9, you hear about this conversion where he's basically like smacked off uh, onto the road and knocked over and blinded for three days, and God really hits him. And that changes something for Paul. And suddenly he takes all that energy and all of those gifts, all those superpowers, if you will, and starts using them to tell people about Christ instead. 
And Paul's witness on a whole level is one of those that is often referred to as what it means to look like and to be a pastor. And Bowden wasn't trying to pastor communities. He was usually arguing with people. He, he had kind of this personality that was abrasive. Uh, if you think about it in superhero terms, he's kind of like Iron Man, right? He, he's got all this intelligence, all these smarts, can do so many things, and just ends up buttonheads with people throughout the course of his career, particularly those who were local Hebrew leaders who knew how he used to be and now are wrestling with how he is now. And our passage comes after he skipped town from angering two such leaders in two different communities. And he winds up in Athens and is actually just kind of there waiting for some of his friends to join him. As he walks around, he notices there's a bunch of these idols. Uh, if you remember your history class, you know that Athens in Greece is one of those places that has tons of temples and tons of, of just culture and history embedded in it. Even by the Roman Empire, a lot of that Greek culture that was there before was still influential. And the people of Athens were well known for being curious, almost as curious, you might say, or just as curious as a preschool chapel class. They had questions, they, they had different thoughts and different philosophies and, and really just spent time wrestling through those with one another, reasoning through them, trying to figure out what the best understanding of life might be. And so all those things mean that Paul's resume at this moment doesn't really matter to that community. And yet here he is in, a, in an instance where he's going to preach to them. And he does so by meeting them where they are. Let's look at verse 22. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gave, gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. It's kind of brilliant, right, that he's able to come in this space recognize the community he's in, recognize what's important to them, and tie that in to this message about Christ. And at that point, you know, they really want to keep listening to him. He eventually loses them as you go on the passage and he gets to talk about resurrection and, and something that really sometimes we take for granted as being such an unbelievable act of God. All these different philosophies that are present wrestle with, do we even care about what happens in the afterlife? Or do we really want to go through something like death? Those are questions that are being asked of him that we don't necessarily hear in the story, but you know they're being asked around what he's saying. And at this point, we have to ask ourselves, what's the point of this passage? What are we supposed to take out of it? Because if you've read it before, you've heard someone preach on it, they may have mentioned that Paul teaches us a model for preaching, to know the context that you're in and to be able to find things in it that help point to God. I know and in my training as a pastor, I've heard those things. And, and if you're supposed to be good at preaching, you can do that well. And that's not the only thing, though, because as important as preaching is, and as it's not just something that pastors do, all of us have a chance to talk about our faith and tell a story in that way. There's more to it. Others might say that Paul does a good job of making sure that whatever context he's in, he's speaking the truth. And certainly, you know, we would like to think that he's right on. He's telling things as we understand it to be, and he's describing God, and, and we can relate to that. But I want to push us to look even further than those things. For just a moment, I want us to simply think about what it means that Paul valued someone else's context enough to appreciate it. And he valued a different people enough to hear them and how he spoke to them. He created a space for these Athenians to know God without them having to know God his way initially. He met them where they were without them having to catch up to where he was. It's pretty incredible. If you think about it, God is really good at meeting us where we are. Think about for a moment where you met God. You might tell somebody sitting next to you or just recount it out loud, right? Like what kind of moment it was when we came to understand who God was to us. You know, for someone like me, I grew up in the church. 
And I always knew that God was there and knew that God loved me, but it wasn't until I was in high school before that, that really like changed for me. It was when my dad was sick with cancer and people from our church came and like dropped off meals. I was like, well, goodness, <laughs> there really must be something to this God that's more than just on Sunday mornings. You might have a story like that. And some of us remember these stories and some of us, you know, have moments in those stories where we think we're like Paul, where we get smacked off our feet and feel like we're blinded for three days. Others of us have more subtle interactions where we come to know God. But deep down, all of those stories of coming to meet God are true, and yet none of them single-handedly define our understanding of God. None of them. None of our individual stories could do justice to who God is. Our God is not defined by any one particular context. And so Paul, in this moment where some might have expected him to quote from the Hebrew scriptures, or what we know as the Old Testament, where some may have known, wanted him to lay out a theology that would have made perfect sense to anyone who had been from Paul's background, but would mean nothing to these Athenians. That's proof to us that God can exist in different places and come across in ways that we perceive differently, but still be present nonetheless. Paul's work in Athens opened the door for some folks to come to know Christ in a way that was different than Paul had and was still legit. Those preschoolers that I was with, they had just a clear of path of relationship with God, if not clearer than I do, right? All of us have this opportunity, this space, as we think about it. And that's kind of the amazing thing about our God. That's one of God's superpowers, that we're given this gift, that if we think through it, if we reason through it to a certain degree, use that power for good, we can recognize that this is true. Because, you know, think back to Athens. They spent a lot of their time in courtyards like this. They would sit around and talk about philosophy and what about the meaning of life and all those kind of questions that maybe you've asked in a dorm room or maybe you've asked on a front porch or a swing somewhere. They've wrestled with those constantly. And if we spend too much time reasoning, then we sometimes become so focused on what we think is right that it doesn't really become about God anymore. It becomes about what we think and keeping that going. In a culture like Athens, where the reason is constantly used to compare and contrast, you might think of it like a different type of culture than we have here in the States, where it's almost competitive, where we use our reasoning to figure out who can be the smartest, who can have the best definition, who can have the shortest, most succinct explanation for everything that happens in life. And sometimes as we focus so much on trying to do that, we lose sight of the very purpose of that reasoning and thinking and, and space that we were given in the first place. That God gave us his ability to think through and appreciate things, to be challenged, heck, to be wrong sometimes, because that's what it means to recognize that we're growing, to recognize that others and their stories have just as much meaning and impact as our own. You know, how, how Sean came to know God isn't the best story for everyone, because not everyone grew up as a white middle-class kid in Northern Virginia. How those of us gathered here as part of this church understand God isn't the only way people in our area come to understand God. We have neighbors, we have people in our community that, that have had a different experience of what it means to know Christ. And if we truly love them, if we truly want to be in community with them and, and you know, do what Paul did on a good day and go to as many people as possible, and we have to be willing to hear and appreciate those stories and value them, not just as something that we can use to get our point across, but as worthy in their own right. So we ask ourselves today, how do we meet others where they are in that way? How do we recognize that God met us in all of our brokenness and all of our problems and all of our struggles? God met us when we didn't have it all together. So we can bear witness to that and how we meet others, knowing that we don't have it all together and there's no expectation for them to have it all together either. How do we create a space that is familiar to them as a weekly chapel service, as a front porch, as a coffee shop, as a weekend hangout? 
I'll tell you one of those ways is being willing to respect those stories. To go in those places that are unfamiliar and to see them and say, I see good in this space. I want to go back to verse 24 for a second. Paul says, The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. There's not a space that we can create that is so perfect that God's going to stay there. Now, in fact, our God is so great that God goes to as many places as we can imagine. God is wherever we're willing to see, God is present. And so, as a pastor, over these six years, I've had just as many opportunities to see God at work in a basement of a house, on a softball field, in a restaurant, just out on a walk, as I have in a space that was designated for worship. It's not a knock on those spaces that are designated for worship, but it's, it's a revelation about how amazing our God is. What superpower that is that our God can be in those spaces. Because friends, sometimes we're going to meet people that would never step foot in a church, that would never step foot in a place that some of us hold so dearly in our hearts as sacred. We're going to bump into people in restaurants, though. We're going to bump into people on the street. We're going to bump into people at a game or just somewhere. (laughs) That's not the church. Because the church building, as beautiful and important as those are, and, and here at first we're working on creating a facility that people can come to know Christ in. But we also know that those aren't the only places that people come to know Christ. Where are those safe spaces that we can create? A few years ago, part of this journey as well, I remember uh, I was at a restaurant for a thing that we call pub theology at the time. And I got an opportunity to talk uh, to a friend of mine. His name is Max. And I remember him saying that it was the most comfortable church setting he'd ever been in. We were sitting at a table in a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> and there was a conversation going on, and it was, I, I don't remember the question we had at the time, but it had to do with where people saw God in their midst, right? Like, where God was, how God was calling us to be a community. If that space wasn't there, and that's not to say that Sean made that space, that's a moment that God called us and brought us all together for in a context that was different. And all we had to do was listen. And you could hear how God is at work. Friends, at a time where it is so easy for us to be caught up in how and what we're reasoning, they would forget how to think through. It's so easy to get caught up in what we're trying to say that we forget that sometimes it's not about the words that we're saying. It's about the spirit that we're conveying. It's about the God they're bearing witness to. A God who we live and move and have our being. What kind of safe space can you create this week? Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the safe space you are creating right now. Where we're in different spaces all together, but yet you are making something holy happen and bringing us together. And so in being brought together, we lift up prayers for leaders of our community, state, nation, and our world. We pray for all those affected by COVID-19. We pray for first responders, for all those serving in roles, providing care for others, for all those who teach and who learn whether they have a degree to show for it or not. We pray that we have the courage to be hospitable towards others, to be an anti-racist people, to acting in ways that are anti-racist until racism has gone from this world. We pray for those affected by disaster, both natural and man-made. We especially pray for those in Miami-Dade County in Florida. We lift up those who use their voice to amplify the voice of others who are oppressed. We lift up all those serving away from home, those without homes, and all those who could not be with us today. We commit ourselves to resisting evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. We pray for peace. We lift up Bob, Brian, Ed, Jeff, Joy, Rebecca, and others on our church prayer list. We pause and lift up others on our hearts and minds as well. God, as for all these people that we give thanks to you, each and every one of these persons, and we value each and every one of their stories, And we give thanks 
for the ways that you've been present in our lives in such special ways. We also ask, God, that as we look for you to guide us in the ways that we do not understand, that you also empower us to equip us, to transform us, that we might be able to witness to your love whatever community we find ourselves in the ways that we do understand. With that, we join together in the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's at this point in our service that we get to worship together with our offering. There's a couple different ways you can share your offering with us here at First UMC. You can give online by going to our website and going to our giving page. You can bring your offering in to an in-person worship service, and you can also mail your offering in to the church during the week. Uh, but one of the things you should know that one of the ministries that your offering goes to support here at First UMC is called Teens Opposing Poverty. Uh, the, it's an organization that helps to get young people together uh, and to have them serve in parts of our communities where folks are without housing, where folks are without the resources they need to get by. And so it's this opportunity to remember that it's not just about you know, gathering those resources, but there's also the relationships that are built in doing that and sharing those things and being there with folks from different backgrounds and different experiences. Uh, we're grateful for them. We're grateful for what they do. And that's one of the many ministries that you get to support by giving to First UMC. And one of the ways that you get to be the hands and feet of Christ, your offering. So whether you've given before or you've given for a long time, we know and you should know that we're grateful for your prayers. We're grateful for your offerings of time and we're grateful for the gifts that you share. And we ask that you pray over those as we're praying over ours as we listen to a musical offering. Again, friends, as we continue our series on superpowers, I want to take another moment to share uh, some friends with you, introduce you to some friends that have been sharing their superpowers of music and humor over the last few months as part of our church. And so I want to introduce you. These are folks who make up our music ministry, and they do a wonderful job. You've heard them each week. And so I really want to take a moment to say thank you for all that you guys do to help make our worship so lively and so meaningful. So thank you for that. Along with that, 
If you are sitting at home thinking, hey, I would like to be part of a music group, maybe it's because you're great at singing or maybe it's because you want to learn how, or maybe there's another way you have a gift of sharing in music, this is the right kind of group to be a part of, to share your superpowers and to grow together as a team. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you can comment uh, on, on Facebook or on Instagram. You can also send an email to the email address below. But again, thank you all so much for what you do to share your superpowers with First UMC. Let us take this time now to bow our heads and, and offer up a prayer to God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the being that you are and for meeting us where we are and finding us in the ways in which we need your help and we need your presence. We are ever gracious and thankful for a God who knows what's going on with us and who helps us to be a better person and who helps us through difficult times and who is there even when we don't kind of give him the attention that maybe we should. We offer up our gifts and tithes to the betterment of your kingdom for these to be used in ways that only you know will be helpful, that will reach people that you know need it, and that will be a, a help to those around us. We hope that we're able to be your hands and feet in the world, and this is why we give of our time and our tithe. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, at this point, we get to conclude our worship service together, and we're so grateful that you chose to be with us for online worship today. Uh, a couple things you should know as we get ready to go. First, know that tonight at 5 o'clock, uh, assuming it is not raining where we have not pre-recorded, that we'll be at the Winchester Royals game at Jim Barnett Park. If you're anywhere local, we'd love to see you there. Uh, we're really excited for the opportunity just to get to be in the same space and sharing that time together. Also, over the next couple weeks, you're going to see our Vacation Bible School registration open up. If you know of any young people that are really good at asking those questions that stump people like me, we'd love for them to be a part of our Vacation Bible School, to have that space where they can ask those questions and come to know God. They probably already know God really well, but just to have that space to be with others and to, to hear their stories and share those together. Friends, with those opportunities, know that whether you're with us online or you're with us in person, we value you, we're grateful for you. And now we get to go. And whatever your context, wherever you may be this week, I pray that you find that space that you get to make safe for someone else to know God. We have God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, the God in whom we move and live and have our being. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.